I'm Rick Miller, and welcome to Xing the Gap. Xing the Gap is an extension of my Boom trilogy of solo stage shows, documenting 75 years of history on our planet from 1945 to 2020. It's about the big stories from Hiroshima to COVID-19, but it's also about family. Part one, Boom, is about the baby boom generation and my parents' coming of age story. Part two, Boom X, is my own Gen X coming of age story. And part three, Boom YZ, is about Gen Y, millennials, and Gen Z, and my daughter's coming of age story. In Xing the Gap, I'm not the performer, but the host of an intergenerational conversation between a baby boomer and a millennial. Sometimes we break the rules and go younger or older, but the goal is always the same, to discover how differently we see things, but that together we can build bridges of understanding, find a shared humanity, and save the world from itself. Boom. In today's episode, my guests are Fiona Reed and Mare Pavri, two incredibly talented Canadian artists. Fiona's a legend of stage and screen, member of the Order of Canada and a mother of two children. Mare is a multidisciplinary artist who does it all, opera, musicals, theater, film and TV, with a particular passion for new Canadian works. We cover a lot, generational misunderstandings, technological transformations, evolving views on policing, institutions and authority, letting go of old ideas, being frightened of social media, acknowledging algorithms, stretching phone cords, admiring your parents even though they don't know what LOL means. That plus a game show. My friends, it's time for Xing the Gap. Mayor and Fiona, welcome to Xing the Gap. Mayor, I'll ask you first, tell us about who you are. Yeah, so um, I'm an Indo-Canadian soprano from London, Ontario, and I grew up doing music and opera. And after studying music at university, I went on to perform opera and musical theater for over 10 years. And now I've sort of, since the pandemic, transitioned into more film and television, obviously, because theaters aren't open right now. <laughs> Perfect. And Fiona? Um, I am a... Um, Scottish British immigrant from the age of 12 in Canada so definitely Canadian um I've done a lot of theater and um and I've done some TV and uh, the King of Kensington was popular with people who are um of my vintage and I it was a movie called A Big Fat Greek Wedding was uh, sort of you know seen by a lot of people so that it gives me some recognition, but but mainly my body of work is in the theater, pretty much. Perfect. And you mentioned vintage. Uh, would you identify as a generational cohort? Are you a baby boomer or something else? Definitely baby boomer. Okay. Definitely white and definitely privileged. <laughs> I identify as all those things. <laughs> and Mayor, do you yeah. identify with a, a cohort at all? I would say I'm a millennial. Yeah. Okay. Millennial. And for yeah. everything that is carried with millennials and baby boomers, we're going to, that's what this podcast is all about, is to try to shake up some of those things that we, we tend to dismiss and judge and to, and to actually listen and learn from each other a little bit too. So I'll, I'll ask you on that note, if you were to give a quick hit about, um, I'll start with you, Fiona, about millennials in general, what do you think is a big misunderstanding that we have about millennials? Because I'm Gen X. Oh, Yeah. So the difference between Gen X means you were born when then? I was born uh, kind of, Gen X is generally mid 60s to like 1980-ish. Oh, and okay. anyone after that is considered a millennial. And the, okay. the latest generation, so my daughters are Gen Z, born sort of uh, after the mid 90s. So I would say that, okay, so my kids born in the 80s, what does that make them? That makes them uh, millennials, like uh, early oh, millennials. Okay, okay. okay. So just to say, um, I think the biggest, well, the, the thing that one says about millennials is, oh, they're so entitled. And I think what we get wrong is that um, the world is so, so much tougher. I mean, when I look at, at how easy it was for me to become what I became and how hard it is now for someone to do the same thing, I just don't think we have a right to say that that they're entitled because you better feel entitled because you're not going to get the kind of legs up that I had. So yeah, you have to own yourself, you know? 
So uh, I was allowed to go from pillar to post with a with a measure of, you know, oh, I'm so humble and oh, I really hope I get ahead, but I just don't really know what I'm doing. And well, good luck with that. I wouldn't I wouldn't get to first base if I were doing that today. So, yeah, that's, I think, the biggest misconception. Okay, and Mayor, the word entitled, I'm sure you've heard it being thrown around for, for millennials. What does that make you feel? And uh, on the contrary, what do we tend to, mi- how do we misrepresent baby boomers? Um, okay, so I'll go with the misrepresenting baby boomers first because my parents' generation has really surprised me. I mean, I remember the day that my mom got WhatsApp and started texting and using her phone and I was like, mom knows how to do this. <laughs> and I have to add, she used LOL a lot because she thought it meant lots of love. So, oh, that's so, good. <laughs> so I'd say something serious and she'd be like, Oh, LOL, LOL. You know, and I'm like, mom, what are you like? Nothing's funny about this. You know? <laughs> so, um, but the way that they've adapted I, I just, I, I can't imagine, you know, I, I see my parents, I, I saw my parents typing with one finger and now they're as fast as me. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm really impressed. I would say I'm just really impressed with all the, all the things that they've had to adapt to, because I mean, I, I do remember dial up internet, obviously, but you know, the, the transitions that they had to made, make were way more intense than what I did. I, I feel, and I just, I do remember feeling very surprised at, you know, how tech savvy my, my parents can be. That was definitely a surprise. (laughs) One aspect of ageism in our culture is that we discount older people for being unable or unwilling to learn. And though some of our elders are indeed unable or unwilling to learn, in my experience, the vast majority of older people are hungry for knowledge. They want to grow, and they want to feel connected to family, friends, and community. And though technology can help us, it often hinders us because it moves so fast, and it deepens the gap between generations. Baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials all have this in common. We're digital immigrants, unlike Gen Z, who are digital natives. We weren't born with the internet. We immigrated to it. And though we use different platforms and communicate in very different ways, we're all in the same boat. And we're all just trying to stay afloat. I would lose my mind when my sisters or brother picked up the phone and I was Googling something. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because they would just disconnect, you know? You were always like, who was that person? (laughs) And Fiona, do you remember the time when we had one phone in our house and there was a cord? And I don't know if you you remember that, but you'd have to stretch the long cord into the other room to get a private conversation. I remember it really well because um, when I was doing, I won't say who, I shouldn't, I don't want to give this away, but I, when I was doing my TV show, a certain actor <laughs> would phone me on Saturday mornings to tell me how he thought the week had gone and how we were doing. And I got to say, you know, he wanted to talk. And, and I remember that darn chord because I thought if I could just make myself a coffee, but will it reach, you know, I just I, I really I felt like, um, you know, I, I felt like I was I thought, OK, I'm not on the clock. It's Saturday morning. I don't want. But you you you. Yeah, you listened and you and you said, OK, I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. But woo, that was hard because now I don't always like to do FaceTime because I can get stuff done when I'm on the phone. Right. You can really as long as you, you have to be very careful about the microphone and what you let slip and get hurt. But you can you can you know, I can do stuff in the kitchen. And and if I chop not too loudly, I can I can get dinner started, you know. But in them days, boy, <laughs> that wasn't, it was really a uh, phone curled under. Commit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have and, people and, joining and, in and from and the other cord. room going, oh, sorry to interrupt. You know, there's no yeah. private calls. Yeah, OK, so, and then, so you, and, and then you go too far and you drop the phone. Remember, the phone <laughs> goes sunk on the floor because you actually did try to go into the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway. So, so technology obviously is a huge distinguishing factor between the generations, but I mean, Fiona, you have, you have, um, I know that your parents both served in the, 
the UK military. Mm-hmm. You have played mm-hmm. the queen, and I, I don't mean mm-hmm. Freddie Mercury. You have you, <laughs> you've tasted institutions in in a very yeah. interesting way, and you mm-hmm. probably have a great deal of respect for the people you've portrayed as well, such as Queen Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And now I'd say our younger generation has a different view of institutions, and I just want to kind of hit on that a little bit to find out uh, first from you, Fiona, what do you see in terms of your generation's view? of how we respect institutions or challenge them versus a younger person's perspective on it. Yeah, I think we need, um, I think we need a dose of what the younger generation has to give us. Um, my daughter, oh gosh, I hope I'm always telling tales out of school and I hope I'm not, but, um, um, my daughter is now at, at law school, but she did experimental theater for some years and, and she's always, um, interested in social advocacy. And so I was working in Montreal at the Centaur and she said, oh, mom, I'm going to a demo. And it was for a, uh, a man of color had been killed by the police. And and um, and so we're walking down Sherbrooke and 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 they start chanting, no justice, no peace, no peace for the police. And I and I said, you know, Julia, I, I, I just can't bring myself to say the police. And she said, why not? what like it totally she looked at me like I was a frog or something you know like how could you not say that this is all pre George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and 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 now I understand you know I understand more of that but but certainly the idea of because when my kids were in high school and and stuff happened for them to call the police they would say mom we don't want to do that and I go but there's a police do you call them? You know, so uh, I've been brought up short, you know, certainly my obsequiousness to to authority. Um, I still have it. it. It goes right down to my feet. I mean, if a policeman stopped, I would be, bah, 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 you know, because I it, it, you can't get rid of that muscle memory of that fear. But but I'm starting to see that. um it, it has to be earned. And, and I'm learning a lot from my, my kids in, in that respect. I just, yeah. Anyway, that's enough on that. Yeah. Thanks. I'm learning from my, from my kids too. And I, I had a similar mm-hmm. issue around defund the police and the word defund mm-hmm. the police. And yeah. so Mayor, I'll turn it over to you. You probably have, I'm not asking you to represent your generation. It's more your, your mm-hmm. personal opinion, but how do you feel your cohort feels about institutions in general? Well, I think it depends on what the institution is, but I do feel like we do have a voice to make change. And that comes with, again, technology and social media and Twitter and Instagram and all of those things. And I feel like, I feel like we as a collective feel like we can make a difference, which is a really good feeling. So to challenge different institutions and to challenge things that we don't agree with, you know, um, I think it, if you want to, you're right. Like, I feel like anyone in my generation would have no problem just saying F the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so when you hear, I mentioned defund the police and the nuance around what that word meant, uh, it, and I'm, again, I'm not asking you to stand behind defund the police. I'm just curious because my daughter told me something that was interesting. She said, we don't necessarily think there should be no policing, right? Defund doesn't mean take away all the money. It just means refund in a way, like a shift, reallocate funding. And I said, well, why do you use defund? She said, well, if we didn't use defund, no one would pay attention to us. If we said reallocate the police funding, that that wouldn't <laughs> grab people's attention. So what do you think of that? Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with her. And I, and I think when I think defund, I think reallocate anyways. And an older person like me and, and maybe Fiona would hear defund it and you think, are you crazy? We really don't want any police at all. I don't know, Fiona, am I, am I speaking for you? That's what I first heard. uh, Yeah. And and this is where we have to be educated by mayor's generation and by our children. It's just like uh, black lives matter. When, when people co-opt, I mean, how could you co-opt something like Black Lives Matter? How could you possibly have an issue with that? And anyone who says, white lives matter is needs to go to school and not come away and go on social media until they've learned an awful lot. Like there's just no equivalency, but, but so unfortunately, you know, three words 
can mean such different things to different people and take them in different directions. And so the challenge is to have the dialogue between those two groups who hear such different things. I guess it's just a question of how much people want to um, let go. And I think with my generation, especially some white people have trouble letting go because it's just too much has been taken for granted. And uh, anyway, that's a tough one. It is a tough one. For those of us past a certain age, especially those of us whose voices have been dominant in society, see straight, cis, white, male, it's tempting to think that adding our voice to everything immediately makes everything better. Uh, no. One of the major themes of the Boom Trilogy and Xing the Gap is that younger generations need to be heard. And that means people like me need to shut up and listen sometimes. And when you listen, you learn to accept that things are changing constantly and it's normal it's natural it is inevitable all these words are slowly they're, they're fluid and they're always shifting every year and mayor i'll ask you this i have a feeling that young people given that their careers are going to be disrupted every five or ten years they have a much more a sense of fluidity versus older people who become more encrusted in an ideology an idea and they become less prone to, to openness and fluidity. Would you say that's true? Um, I think it depends on the person. I don't, I don't know if that's a, a generational thing because you have all stars like Fiona and yourself, you know, recognizing all these things and having these kinds of conversations. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that could be a generational, a generational thing. Yeah. What about around uh, gender and uh, sexuality? Would you say younger people have more of a tolerance to even breaking up institutions like marriage and, and, and shaking out definitions of it? Would you say that that's more generational? Yes, for sure. I think that gender fluidity is much, much more of a conversation today than I'm sure it was, you know, when, when you guys went to school um, and things like pronouns and all of, all of that. It's, it's just really at the forefront of everything right now. Um, so definitely. Okay. And I'll ask you both this, uh, are you active on social media? And we'll start with you, Fiona. Are you, uh, do you participate? I won't do it, I won't do it at all. I just Not won't do it. I'm, 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 I'm afraid of it. I mean, I'm afraid of it because of the, first of all, um, I'm a, the kind of person that after I've had a dinner party, I weigh everything the next day. Did I say this? Did I offend that person? Did I? So can you imagine if I put something out that lacked the right context on social media? I'm so frightened of something coming back to haunt me. Um, you know, the, the lack of humor, like I don't think social media understands humor all the time. So I can't go near it, which is terrible because we have a son in Australia and we miss all kinds of good stuff on Instagram with him, but I just won't do it. I just won't do it. And, and, uh, so I have friends who are on social who, if they think I should know something, they go, Oh, we better let Fiona know. So that's, <laughs> I'm the sort of the tail end of everybody else who's on social. They go, okay, we'll let her in on this, you know, but that's it. And Mayor, I know you're active on social media. Well, active more or less, because I've, I've did some research today and I <laughs> went and looked you up. So what, how would you how, say your relationship like how, to it? I love, I love social media. And I love how now people are using this to research people, <laughs> you know, and I, and I think that is a thing. I mean, you know, you, you, I think if somebody tells me about the new person, the first thing I do is find them on Instagram. Mm. <laughs> is that where you, you get know? your, your news and information too? A lot of it. I would say most of it. Yeah. And do you, yeah, there, uh, go, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, if there's anything big and major happening, you're going to hear about it on social media for sure. And does it, do you check where it's coming from or do you, do you mm -hmm. mind sometimes? Is that something that crosses your mind? I do. I do try to, and I definitely have friends that are really into, um, fact checking all, all of that kind of stuff. So I have, you know, that group of people that I can really trust when it comes to those kinds of things. But I also think, you know, we're human and we make mistakes. And I think that I really think that my generation of people, I know that 
there's this whole cancel culture out there and all that. And I, I just feel like, you know, our thoughts and opinions are fluid and they're going to change. And I could have a different opinion on what we talked about, you know, next week. And I think that's the beauty about being human and we're going to make mistakes and mistakes are okay. Um, and to empathize with people who are growing and learning and changing, I think is super important. So you're a, you're a millennial and it's said that, you know, Facebook is slowly becoming something for older people. That's, you know, especially with the, the, the bad news around Facebook these days and the rebranding and such is, is Facebook something you use or are you more Instagram or something else? Or you mean Meta? I heard meta, it's now yes. called Meta. <laughs> I just I saw Zuckerberg speak about Meta, and I just he he appears in my play. I do an interview with him and Noah Yuval Harari, who's an author I respect a lot. Oh, very and much. He's just yeah. sitting there, and he's nodding, and he just seems like a robot. And I anyway, I I have a lot of I used to view. Mark Zuckerberg as just being someone who um, I was buying into the idea that he just wants the world more connected. And he happens to be someone who wants creative control. I've been a very creative controlling person my entire career and uh, trying to be a business entrepreneur and in his industry that is not as lucrative as tech. But I, I identified with him early on, but I sort of look at this now and I think, I don't know, what's your... What's your view about Facebook generally? I know what you're, well, you're going to say, Fiona, you're going to go, you don't even touch it with a 10 foot pole, right? No. And I think Mark Zuckerberg has a bit to answer for because his policy in, in is it where Vietnam or is it Indonesia is quite different than his policy in North America. Yeah. You know, I mean, what he does to make uh, profit is there's no consistency to it in terms of morality. So, yeah. So, and I, but, but Mayor, don't, don't you ever worry about the algorithm that your, your news is determined by an algorithm? Does that, I think I'm just, I think I'm just aware of that. Yeah. I think I'm just aware of that. And, um, I th yeah, I think just knowing that kind of takes the power away from from it. I mm. mean, I haven't had I haven't had Facebook for so long now. I don't, I don't remember when I, I had Facebook. I have a Facebook page, but that's just for singing stuff because I feel like it needs to be out there. But I haven't been on Facebook in so long, and I do I do think that you know social media is such a double edged sword, not only for misinformation but for your own peace of mind and. Um, I think it's also such a huge time waster. I think there, I think there are benefits, but it's very easy and scary to, to go on the other side of it where, you know, you're spending way too much time on it. I feel so terrible for the, gen the, the generation younger than me, who they believe that people look completely flawless all the time with all these wacky filters and things like that. You know, I don't really believe that there's anything I think it's hard to be truly authentic on social media. I think everybody's just like, this is my highlight reel, but also everybody knows that. And it can be this fun, creative outlet. It's all kind of whatever you make of it. But I do really feel like it's this double-edged sword where it's like, you could go too far and it could be very misinformative and it could be very detrimental to your mental health, but it's also this great thing. So yeah, I, I agree with you that it, it's great. You know, the fact that we have GPS and I can Google and there's just so many great things that come with it. And, you know, the Gen X side of me who was sort of brought up in the 70s, kind of mistrusting many institutions, government, especially media, I come at it going, I don't want anyone pulling my strings. So when I think of the algorithm and the autocrats that will more and more use the algorithms and giving me misinformation, I have a real Gen X kick on, I, I don't want anything to do with that. So my compromise is I use it for promotion and like you, Mayor, I, I, I'm on it somewhat reluctantly, but I've decided never ever to read a comment section ever, ever again. Because I find comment sections just descend into, after the third comment, which might be constructive, it turns into the shit show the, that the internet can be. I, I didn't uh, in Australia, didn't uh, Facebook have to make some accommodation with the publishers because um, they they had to pay for some of the content or to the publishers and they agreed to do that because that's what I think should happen so that 
at least if you're a journalist working for the Washington Post or the Sydney Herald or whatever, you get some credit for that. And somebody knows whose voice it is and for whom they work. And I mean, I just don't understand how Facebook can get all that content for free and just purvey that content. Um, and they make the profit. Anyway, it doesn't seem fair to the people who write the articles. Facebook or Meta these days gets away with it as they haven't been regulated as a media company, even though that's how much of the world uses it. If Facebook and others were regulated as media companies, they would face the same strict advertising rules and restrictions that govern TV, print, and traditional media. It's one part of a larger problem in this great social experiment that is the internet, where the prevailing business model, the attention economy, has created the most successful companies in the history of companies. They connect us to the world, but they also feed us with propaganda. They watch our every move, they manipulate us, and they suck our data for profit. A far cry from the utopia imagined at the dawn of the internet. I offer the audiences in my play a vote on three different endings to the show that they can vote on with their phone. And they do this through intermission and some all the way to the end of the show. Between utopia, which I define as more or less, uh, let's reimagine the road. Status quo, which sounds terrible, but actually means let's just carry on the road, trying to you know push these institutions forward as slowly, as, better, as best as we can. And dystopia, which is destroy the road or blow up the road. Most young people vote for dystopia because they have a view of that that is like, yeah, let's, let's blow up these institutions and start them again. And most older people are like, it's been such bad news. I want utopia. So I get these votes and I have to then perform the ending that each audience has chosen. But I'm going to ask you, without being able to elaborate on, on those three, what would you vote for if you were sitting in a theater going, what ending would I like to see? I'll ask, uh, Mayor, why don't you go first? Well, I was just laughing so much because as soon as you said all the younger people like wanted dystopia, I was like, yeah, that was totally my first answer. <laughs> I just want to blow everything up and start it all over again. <laughs> okay. And Fiona, I know it's hard to say out of context, but uh, if you were presented those three words, utopia, dystopia, for the, status for the future, quo. For the future of the world? Well, it's kind of like what... Would you want a happy ending to this to this show, knowing that dystopia is going to have Donald Trump reelected? You know those kind of things. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I heard a whole thing on, uh, about hope because climate change is the biggest issue in our world, and and if dystopia means you blow up the power of of, of corporate uh, the corporations to to simply make profit over what makes a better world, then it, then if that gets me to utopia i'll take that dystopia <laughs> but only because i want to get to utopia i want it so Same. badly because our, our, the world deserves it yeah okay so um before we do the little quiz show part i have one last question if you were to pass on a message to each other's generation and say this is a simple message that i think i would like you to know about our generation what would it be oh. who would mm. like to go first um, I would say, um, oh, I bet you, I want, I would love to know what mayor thinks about this because I can tell right away if somebody treats me like I'm an old person. So don't, don't presume that, but if you see the most wrinkled face in the world, don't presume, don't, don't judge what's inside because you just never know. So mayor, this is such a tough one. Um, for my generation, I would have to say, you know, it's, I think it's just a bit, I think it's hard, at least for me, following the footsteps of my immigrant parents. So does that mean I'm first generation Canadian? My parents aren't from here? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I think it is, I think for me, at least there's a lot of pressure to to be as resilient in a way as my parents, because, you know, they came here with nothing and built this incredible life for themselves. And, and sometimes I think to myself, like, could I move to another country at 21 and oh. 
with nobody and all that kind of stuff. And so I would just say like, follow your bliss because you're, you know, like it, it is, I just feel like it is so hard being a first generation Canadian because I could never do what my parents have done. And so sometimes I have to say to myself, okay, you know, be gentler with yourself. You're doing the best you can. Um, and, and they paved this path so that I could follow my bliss. So really, I guess, be grateful for, for that and, and not having to do the trials and tribulations that my parents did and how much sacrifice they, they have made for me. And so that I could follow my bliss so that I could become an opera singer, you know, um, and just to enjoy that and make the most out of it. Those are beautiful answers. Thank you. <laughs> now, this is the part of the Xing the Gap podcast where I call it the generation gap. a game show. I do it on stage. I basically ask a bunch of stupid skill testing questions to find out how little we actually know about each generation's Ooh. pop culture. Ooh. Ooh, Fiona goes, ooh, because you think Same. you're going to get nothing, but maybe you'll both get nothing or maybe you'll both surprise yourself. So I'm going to start with the <sighs> youngest first. Oh, Fiona, you want to go first? No. I, I just guarantee you, I will fail both. That's all I can say. There's Same. no failing. Same. Failing Same. is, uh, you know, a big theme in my work is fail better, right? We're in theater. There's, there's no. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. I love that. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So I'm going to start with, uh, with you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Name a 1960s fad dance. Oh, God. The disco? No, that was the late 70s, but that's okay. Uh, it, you know, the twist would have worked or anything like that. Ooh. That's okay. That's okay. Name um, a British prime minister from the 20th century. John A. MacDonald? No, he was Canada, Canada's first <laughs> oh prime God. minister. Uh, I know okay. nothing. I'm mortified. No, it's okay. It's all good. Hide okay. in my Here. sweater now. No, it's okay. 1970s feminist icon TV show, Who Can Turn the World On With a Smile? Mary Tyler. Fiona mouth it to me. Mary Tyler. Moore? Moore. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Uh, Merit, name the Beatles, all four of them. God, this is so bad. Ringo? Name one beetle. Ringo. 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 What's his last name? Star. Star. <laughs> wow, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, da, 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 sorry, I'm just thinking. If I pulled out a rotary phone, would you know how to call Fiona? No, I don't. I don't have her number memorized. <laughs> Oh, it's true. <laughs> but if you had the thing but in I front could, of you, I could do you would it. know I how to do it, it technically. It's, it's okay. super fun, yeah. And if you had to yeah. load a film <laughs> into a camera, would you know how to do it? I think so, yes. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. um, let's see. Um, name a dance that Madonna made famous. She made a dance famous? <laughs> Strike a pose. Oh, Vogue! Vogue! Okay, good. Okay, famous oh, yeah. 1950s television show, um, I Love Lucy, starred this comedian, Lucille, one of the most famous comedians of all time, Lucille. No idea. Ball. Ball. Oh, okay, my gosh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Who did Prince Charles really want to marry? Camilla. Good. You know, last bonus oh points God. for last name. Oof, I Parker, can't remember. Camilla Parker Bowles. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, oh I think God, that's a... Oh my God, this is so hard. Greg, thanks for your help. I'm going to start with you, Fiona. Are you ready? The clock is ticking now. What is this object I hold in my hand here? Don't know if you can see it well. Uh, uh, is that a dongle? <laughs> Very good. You even got, you got the... It's an adapter, but, you know, some people call it a dongle. Way to go. Okay. Um, would you know what a vape pen looks like? I know what vaping is. <laughs> okay. um, Half points. A vape pen? Would I recognize a vape pen if I saw it? No. Okay, if I had one here, I'd show it I to you, not. but I don't. Okay, uh, finish this okay. lyric. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. 
<laughs> Why don't you take off all of your clothes? There you go. Way to go. All right. Well done. Okay. Uh, Fiona, if you like someone on Tinder, do you swipe right or left or up or down? <laughs> This is so good. This is so good. Please tell me you know yeah. this one. Oh, come on. Come on, Fiona. I, I've got you frozen on Zoom in a, in a kind of like Edward Munch pose. I'm frozen because I'm like this right now. Yeah, you were frozen. Okay, now, um, um, I'm going to ask you the question again. If you like someone on Tinder, you swipe, swipe which way? I see you swipe left. Sorry. No, no, I think uh, right. Mayor knew that one. Okay. Um, let's see. Wh which um, one is it? What let's is swipe it? right. You swipe okay. right. And if you really, oh, really okay. like someone, this is for Mayor. If you really, really super like someone, what do you do? This I is for Mayor. I didn't know that was a thing. I yeah, don't, you I can don't swipe have... up. No, that was a, that was a bonus for the millennial. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, Fiona, name a member of a boy band. Either Backstreet Boys, New Kids on the Block, One Direction. Um, I don't know. Wasn't Justin Timberlake in one one? <laughs> yes, well done. That's good. good. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay. Name um, the Simpsons couple from television. Oh, Marge and um, um, Homer. Yeah, very good. Okay. Who okay. lives in a pineapple mm -hmm. under the sea? Oh, um, one of those Disney characters that I've never seen. Um, princess somebody. No, it's not Finding I, Nemo I, and it's not Ariel. No, it's uh, uh, Mayor, who, uh, who lives on Pineapple Under the Sea? I don't know. SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob! Oh, SpongeBob! Right. SpongeBob. You didn't oh, know. Oh, so oh, you didn't know that one either. Oh. Okay. What is a boomerang when we're talking technology? What's a boomerang? Oh, well, I, I mean, I. I is it when is it, I know the news reference of that, like when news um, you make you want to make some kind of point and it ends up making the opposite point because it boomerangs back. So the person ends up getting the unwanted attention. Right. It's called it's also called the Streisand effect, isn't it? I heard wow. Rachel Maddow talking about it. So oh, I've learned three things. Didn't... And we that didn't one do sentence. a boomerang on set together? We didn't do a boomerang together? What now, what is, is your version boomerang? of a boomerang, Mary? Okay, so it? it's it's basically when, you when you're about to take a photo, but it's like two seconds of just movement. So you just do one thing and then it repeats oh. over and over again. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a, like a GIF or a GIF or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, while oh, you okay. mention it, uh, Fiona, what's the difference between a meme and a GIF? <laughs> idea. <laughs> I have no idea. It's okay. Generally, a meme is a fixed image, whereas a GIF has movement to it, usually. Some kind oh, of repeated okay. movement. Okay. 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 Let me see if I can wrap it up with one stupid question. Um, if someone is clapping back at you online, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, Harold Wilson. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you a British Prime Minister. You're a British, British Prime um, Minister. You've met them all, haven't you? Um, thank you, Fiona. <laughs> no, um, if somebody's clapping back at you, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't know. I'm going to say it's a bad thing. Yeah, I think you're right. It's to respond, you know, generally quickly to criticism. So it's not, not really a good thing. It's not like... Bravo, the Queen. And how does the Queen? How does the Queen wave? Can you just give us throw me a little bone here? How does how do you wave as the Queen? Oh, that's lovely. Fiona, hey! Mayor, I can't thank you enough. Frankly, I don't know who won, but it doesn't matter because uh, Fiona. <laughs> she's even got no. the wave at the top. She knows how to use Zoom and all of yes. its intricacies. <laughs> So you, you have both been wonderful. I know we haven't necessarily, you know, solved all the world's problems, but we had a bit of fun and a super conversation. I got to know each of you. It's been an honor and a privilege. And I thank you so much. And I hope we get to continue the conversation sometime in person. Thank you. I will not, Thanks so much. I will not clap. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> This has been Xing the Gap. Whether you're watching this as a video or listening to the podcast, it was all recorded and edited by me, Rick Miller, with extra multimedia from my amazing team at Kadoons. This series is being launched in partnership with Leap, an online community where life experience meets innovation, created by CABI, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. 
I'd like to extend a huge thanks to the Leap and Cabby teams for helping make it happen. And you can find out more about their work at cabby.com slash leap. A very special thank you to my two guests today, Fiona Reed and Mayor Pavri. Let me know what you think of our conversation and who you'd like to hear as future guests. You can find me at Rick Miller Actor on Twitter or Instagram or on my website, rickmiller.ca. For more information about the Boom Trilogy and other projects on stage and online, check out boomtheshow.com or kidoons.com. And remember, in a polarized world, you have a choice. Build a wall or build a bridge. Build bridges, not walls. Xing the gap.